started. All right, more people joining in. Glad we're waiting for a few more minutes. It's... Yes, I resent the correct link, so hopefully everyone is getting it now. It looks like it because everyone's joining in now. Well, if you if you just if you just joined us, um, we are inviting everyone to write in the chat where you are tuning in from, your name, where you're tuning in from, and how you heard about this event. We have people tuning in from all over Los Angeles, even Hawaii. Of course, a speaker in Washington, DC, um, San Francisco. This is very exciting. That we can to our speaker, that would be great. Everyone is. And we will have some time for QA afterwards. So feel free to type in your questions throughout the program in the chat so that um, we'll get try to get to as many as possible at the end. Elena, I'm very jealous that you have a beach in your background <laughs> in Hawaii. This is great. Well, I will get started. I know more people will be joining in, but I'll get started. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Alicia. I'm the executive director of Fairtrade LA. Um, just want to welcome everyone to Fairtrade LA's World Fairtrade Day celebration with our incredible panelists that we'll introduce shortly. Um, this event is hosted by Fairtrade LA. And we are an educational nonprofit based here in Los Angeles, California. We are a grassroots organization um, of individuals, businesses, nonprofits, congregations, schools, universities that believe that the makers and producers of everything we buy should be paid fairly. And we exist to raise awareness for fair trade as a solution to ending human trafficking. In case you haven't heard, 2020 was a big year for Fair Trail A. After many years of hard work and sacrifice of so many selfless individuals, Los Angeles officially became the largest fair trade city in America, in North America, and the fourth largest in the world. Um, and in August of 2020, with the help of our champion council member, Coretz, who's with us today, Los Angeles City Council unanimously passed to vote, voted to pass the fair trade resolution declaring Los Angeles the largest fair trade city and also declaring every second Saturday of May World Fair Trade Day, which for this year was this past Saturday. So 2021, this means this, this is Los Angeles first official World Fair Trade Day celebration. And though I wish that we could celebrate in person, I am very, very grateful to have such incredible speakers with us from all over the country and thank you for saying yes to our invitation and coming together for this special event, as well as for all of you attendees tuning in from all over the country as well. So what is the purpose of World Fair Trade Day? World Fair Trade Day is celebrated globally every year on the second Saturday of May, and its purpose is to celebrate the contribution of fair trade to fight against poverty, exploitation, and climate change. 
And what is fair trade? Uh, fair trade is all about ensuring that workers around the globe, especially in developing communities, are treated fairly with fair wages and safe working conditions. Uh, globally, the International Labor Organization estimates that there are 24.9 million people trapped in forced labor, working in harsh working conditions and being paid poorly, if paid at all. And But as consumers, we have the power to change this. We have the power to change that by choosing what we buy. And if we buy fair trade, we can show companies that we care about the people behind those products and that we have the power to increase demand for products that lift people out of poverty in a fair and dignified way. And that is exactly why we are here today. For where we're going to make to break the cycle of poverty and fight for justice for children, mothers, and fathers all around the world. So again, a, a little housekeeping as more people are joining in. Um, please make sure that you're muted so that we can listen to our speakers clearly. And we will have some time for Q&A at the end. So throughout the program as speakers are speaking, if feel free to type in your questions in the chat and who you'd like to direct your questions to, and we will try to get to as many as we can at the end. Good. And you can feel free to continue to type in the chat your name, where you're joining in from, and how you heard about this event. So without further ado, um, let me introduce our first speaker. I am so excited to have with us Peg Willingham, the Executive Director of Fairtrade America, the US arm of Fairtrade International, which is the major certifier of Fairtrade products, working with businesses, farmers, and workers to certify products as ethically and sustainably sourced. Peg started her career as the US Foreign Service Officer with tours in Costa Rica, Saudi Arabia, Colombia, receiving five Superior Honor Awards. Peg has previously served as the Head of Advocacy and Policy at the International Food Policy Research Institute which provides policy solutions to sustainably reduce poverty and end, po and end hunger and malnutrition. Prior to that, she was executive director of Shot at Life at the United Nations Foundation, leading a campaign to raise awareness and resources to immunize children in developing countries. At the Inter International AIDS Vaccine Initiative and the ERA's Global TB Vaccine Foundation, she advocated for increasing funding and supportive policies for development of new vaccines. Oh, so impressive. <laughs> Peg, we are so excited to have you with us tonight and to represent Fairtrade America and all the amazing work you're doing with farmers and producers around the world. So please take well, it away. Well, Alicia, thank you so much. Thanks to you all. And uh, I'm, I'm actually gonna turn on my phone um, so I don't go over time, um, but I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here with you all. I'm gonna share my slides. Um, but I just want to say how grateful I am to Alicia, to the board members at Fair Trade LA. Obviously, an honor um, and gratitude to Congress, to Councilmember Koretz uh, and his staff, and to all of you who are watching now or who will be watching the recording later for being champions of fair trade. And it's great to see we have we have students, we have uh, business owners. We have activists, we have people from the faith community. So it just shows that this really is a broad-based movement. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, spoiler alert. So the title of the event is, Is Fair Trade the Future of the Economy? And my answer is yes, that is what we're all here to do. Um, so I'm just gonna very briefly touch on fair trade history, which I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with. Um, what has been the impact of fair trade on the farmers and workers and artisans that we all partner with? prospects for the future. And then we're very excited for us, our World Fair Trade Day excitement is that we have a new product finder on our website. That's the number one question I always get asked. And one of the top reasons come, people come to our website is where can I find this? And it's so exciting. Congratulations to, to Fair Trade LA for being the biggest city. Um, and I know a big piece of that are the businesses that make these products available. Um, and I know we're going to be hearing also from Liesl. And it's exciting to hear about how this is growing across LA, the country, and the world. So just very briefly, um, you know, the fair trade movement really has roots going back to the 17 and 1800s when activists said, 
We should not be buying sugar grown by enslaved people. We should not be buying cotton grown by enslaved people. Um, and then in, you know, in just the last several decades, uh, you know, in the 1940s, faith-based organizations, churches, and other groups, you know, partnered with communities in producer countries to sell coffee and other products, you know, in, in different, uh, you know, church events or other um, houses of worship. And it just, you know, really grew into a movement. Um, and in the 1980s, the Fair Trade International movement um, began when a Dutch priest, um, Father Franz van der Hoff, who'd been working in Latin America for years, was working with a community in Mexico of coffee producers at the time when the global price for coffee plummeted. It was never, you know, people were not getting rich as coffee farmers to begin with, but when the price fell well below the cost of production, it was truly a crisis. And um, he worked with those communities and with people back in his home country, the Netherlands, to create you know, a, a fair trade organization that then became replicated, replicated across Europe, here in the US, Canada, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, um, and of course, all of the producer network countries as well. So these are some of the earliest, you know, trademarks um, of different fair trade organizations. So speaking of which, um, fair trade, there, there's, I'm happy to say there are so many organizations. I know we have someone from 10,000 Villages tonight, which is great. Um, there are different organizations and certifications about fair trade. Now we, um, this makes my eyes hurt as an English major, but we do spell ours as fair trade, all one word. Looks like a typo, but it isn't, but that's just a way to, to sort of distinguish ourselves as fair trade international, fair trade America, as Alicia said. Um, you know, we, we pride ourselves on, on having, you know, really high standards. Um, another thing we're very proud of is that the decisions are made equally. The producers, the farmers um, who are part of this, this community, they have an equal vote and an equal voice. We have our, in our governing body, in our general assembly, in our executive committee, um, half of the people, half of the votes are actually coming from the producers themselves. And as you probably well know, part of the fair trade deal is a minimum price that will be paid to the farmers and workers and artisans, and then um, a fair trade premium, a payment on top of that, that the communities can then invest um, in, you know, democratically voting on it in a way that benefits them. It could be for a clinic. It could be for climate-friendly agricultural practices. Um, you know, it's it's a way to to you know, improve living and working conditions in those communities. And what we do is we, we, we partner with auditors who will go and visit these communities. And during COVID, of course, that hasn't really been feasible, but they're in person um, as well as kind of long distance auditing to check to make sure that the standards, you know, on these, these farms and in these communities are actually being um, adhered to and then fair trade products are available around the world. So um, we, uh, we would also note that some of these um, other fair trade certifications do accept the auditing that we do it for labeling purposes because they consider it to be so reliable. And what is the impact? So these numbers are from uh, 2019. And uh, of course, we have some acronyms on here, but it's CLAC is, is Latin American and Caribbean. NAP is... Uh, the Asia Pacific region and fair trade Africa, of course, is self-explanatory, but this is almost 2 million uh, farming and working families um, that are involved in the fair trade certified producer organizations. And the premium that was generated on these sales and which all of you as consumers have helped make possible um, reached 228 million in 2019. So looking ahead to what are the trends? So you all are already committed activists on fair trade, um, but how do we know that we're gonna keep this going in the future? Well, one thing that is exciting is that, you know, different surveys have shown, for example, majority of millennials have said they would pay more for sustainably sourced products. And that number I think is just gonna to continue to grow. I also think that COVID has made us all more aware of where our food does come from and really everything that we consume. Who are the people on the front lines who are bringing that to us and what are their lives like? We also have survey data that show that 
people just do view fair trade brands more favorably. They see that, and when they understand what that that mark means um, and the ideals behind it, they see it as, as a favorable thing. And when they see the labels with the logos and the certification, um, that they feel it is trustworthy. So what are some of the challenges and opportunities? So we all here believe in fair trade, um, but what might be some of the things, why wouldn't everybody you know, say, Let, let's go for the fair trade? So as you see from this image, um, there are a lot of certifications and labels out there in the world of you know, food, clothing, handicrafts, textiles, and so forth, which is not a bad thing, but you'll see that there are a lot of a lot of different things for consumers to try to make sense of. And so we have done focus groups and heard from people where some say, we really like knowing, you know, where things are come from, how they were sourced, the more information, the better. Um, we hear from some folks though who say, uh, there's just so much and we're not really sure what it all means. And then for the companies, the brands who sell these products, who have become licensees and said, we're going to go through the audit process, we're going to pay these prices, we're going to pay the premium, um, we're going to partner with these communities. They want to put, you know, as, as much about their product on their label, on their packaging as possible. And so to have a lot of different competing certifications on their packaging, um, you know, it, there, there, there are varied levels of demand for that. Some of the opportunities or exciting things that we see, um, there's a variety of things. So, so fair trade is about people and it's about the planet. I think you all know that these smallholder farmers, you know, so much of our coffee and our cocoa are grown on farms uh, of just a few acres in size um, by farmers who contribute the least to climate change and yet really are on the front lines and affected by it the most, whether it is too much rain, not enough rain, um, drought, diseases that affect plants or insects that aff affect plants um, only get worse um, it, you know, because of climate change. So climate being a really big issue, um, we're glad to, whoops, there is my phone telling me it's time to wrap up and I'm almost done. Um, so climate being important, Amazon has a climate pledge friendly program where they highlight certifications that have a positive impact on climate. So we're glad to see that fair trade is part of that. Obviously social justice, you know, we think about 2020, one of the big things is a global pandemic of racism um, and, a, and a greater awareness of social justice. You all know that fair trade is about social justice. There's legislation. I'm so delighted we have a legislator with us tonight that, that you know, policy makes a difference. And then a company like Ben and Jerry's um, has made a big announcement that they're in addition to their already outstanding commitment to fair trade. Um, every pint of Ben and Jerry's has a fair trade trademark on it saying that all of the ingredients that they can source fair trade, they do. But they've also said on top of that, we are gonna now commit to a living income that goes even beyond the fair trade minimum price and premium. So they're paying even more to their cocoa farmers. So. There's a lot going on that's exciting. Um, I'm just my last slide. We hope that you'll come to our website and that you will sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media. But again, for World Fair Trade Day, we're very excited to share our new product finder to make it even easier to find the products in LA and beyond. So thank you all so much. And I now have the honor to turn the baton over to Council Member Koretz. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, that was really inspiring, and even especially for me working locally, um, I'm excited to hear all about this, all about the impact, and also the product finder. That is something that we've needed for a while, so I'm going to jump on that after this call. Um, so uh, again, if you have any questions for Peg, feel free to type in the chat, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, next, I am very honored that we have with us today our advocate and our champion at Los Angeles City Council, Council Member Paul Koretz. Council Member Koretz is finishing his third and final term representing 250,000 people in the 5th District of Los Angeles, a dis district that includes Bel Air, Westwood, and Sino. Environmentally, he is best known for being the first council member to call for LA to move beyond coal power, banning plastic bags, helping close, close down the San 
Onofre <laughs> uh, Nuclear Generating Station, establishing efforts to protect biodiversity and wildlife habitat connectivity in the city of 4 million human beings. And in partnership with LEAP LA Coalition, instituting the world's first climate emergency mobilization office. Establishing fair trade requirements is one of a number of purchasing policies he is currently working to institute. So council member Kretz, we are so honored to have you with us tonight. And I just want to personally say thank you so much for being willing to take the lead on our fair trade resolution and see it all the way through, especially in the midst of 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. Everyone here at Fair Trail LA is forever grateful for that. And the city of Los Angeles is made better because of it. And we are excited to hear from you on how Los Angeles, such an influential and powerful city, is supporting the fair trade movement. So please take it away. Well, thank you, Alicia. And uh, thank you for that nice introduction and for inviting me. And thank you, Peg, for that very inspiring uh, update of uh, how much progress we've made so far. Um, I'm very pleased to be here celebrating World Fair Trade Day with you on LA's first time as an official fair trade city. Um, despite all the chaos in 2020 and the people who suffered and those who we sadly lost and the economic fallout that we're still working hard to overcome, I believe, believe a lot of good things are coming to pass. I feel like we as a planet were sent to our rooms to think about what we had done. And collectively, we've emerged with a more clear eye on the future that we want to create. Uh, an awakening of sorts, I think, has occurred about the way we've been living. Our whole economic system has been predicated on an extractive economy, living at the expense of others, global winners and global losers, the 1% and the 99%. But now I think people are starting to see that nobody wins unless everybody wins. We're all rooted together upon one tiny, fragile, beautiful planet. And the only way forward is by working together, by uplifting all of humanity and all of the creatures we share the planet with. And as we unfurl from COVID and from the Trump years, we need to all take steps back um, and look, look at what we can possibly do to do better and not just a little better, but a lot better. And towards that end in the city of Los Angeles, we've been recreating government, giving a voice to the previously voiceless and taking a look at how we spend the city's money. Among many new projects aimed at encouraging grassroots democracy, we're building a new human rights department, a youth development department, and the one I'm the most involved with and excited about, uh, along with the LEAP LA Coalition and Council Member Bob Blumenfield, uh, we've created what we believe to be the first Climate Emergency Mobilization Office. The mission of the office is to ensure environmental justice, indigenous and labor communities, and uh, other appropriate communities that are most impacted by toxic and climate pollution, that they're at the center of our climate action. So we aren't making anybody's lives worse as we make this vitally important to our shared climate, great transition to clean energy. If the city is going to be serious about reinventing government, we also need to be just as serious about how we use our budget. So we brought the fair trade legislation forward at the end of August, right in the middle of the 2020 chaos and the same week as the celebration of the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And I believe that that was exactly the right moment to bring forward this fantastic fair trade vision of ensuring a more sane and more just and more fair purchasing policy. My colleagues, Mike Bonin and Joe Buscaino and I introduced the legislation to not only officially declare the second Saturday of May annually as Fair Trade, uh, World Fair Trade Day, I should say, but to uh, complete the five criteria necessary for LA to be deemed a fair trade city. And those criteria are an independent local fair trade steering committee who increases awareness and builds demand for fair trade products 
through education, outreach, and public events. Having a range of fair trade products available in local stores, cafes, and other venues. Fair trade products being used by a number of local organizations, including places of worship, schools, hospitals, and offices. Attracting media attention and public support with our local fair trade campaign and having the city council approve a resolution supporting fair trade into the city's purchasing decisions, uh, something we did by uh, introducing legislation to require it. So why was this such a big deal for Los Angeles to take these steps? Well, back in 2013, the Guardian newspaper decreed what many of us had already suspected, that Los Angeles had become the most influential city in the world. We really saw this influence in action after we created our climate emergency mobilization legislation. When we first introduced it, there were only three municipalities in, in the entire world that had recognized the climate emergency. Uh, first, uh, tiny Darabin, Australia. Um, but after we did it, the, uh, the city of Berkeley noticed what we were up to and they declared a climate emergency and invited me to speak at a climate town hall, um, which included representatives from other cities in the regions uh, to recognize our leadership. And then all the cities around the Bay Area began declaring climate emergencies. And then London did it, and then New York City did it. And since then, we now have 1,935 cities across the world um, that have followed our lead. Now, I can't necessarily say that LA can take the credit for all of them. I'm just saying before LA did it, we had three, and now we have almost 2,000. So we're hoping the same thing will happen with fair trade cities. If we can transform how 2,000 cities spend their money, we can create a fair and just global economy where women and children and farmers are treated with the respect that they so richly deserve. As far as Los Angeles, I'd like to see what we can do about making the Los Angeles 2028 Olympics a fair trade Olympics, much like they did in 2012 with the, the London Olympic Games. Um, I'm working to do so with the fair trade organizers um, here who have been working with me since the beginning and who I'd like to thank before I close. So uh, thank you to Alicia Chan, um, Executive Director of Fair Trade LA, and to Joan Harper, the co-founder and, and board director of Fair Trade LA. And most of all, thank you to everyone tuning in tonight. Thank you for your advocacy and for your humanity. And thank you in advance for all the work I know you're going to do to get other cities around the world to join LA and becoming a fair trade city. So thank you all. And I look forward to working with you in the future to uh, attain all of these goals. Thank you so much. Wow, I am so inspired and just so thankful for your involvement and your partnership in all of this. I know we can't do it without your support. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And we look and if you have any questions for council members, feel free to type in the chat and uh, we will try to get to as many as we can at the end. So last but certainly not least, I am excited to introduce to you Liesl Gernholtz, um, a, South African, a South Africa human rights lawyer and the chief program officer at the Little Market. The Little Market is a mission-driven nonprofit fair trade shop that was co-founded by Lauren Conrad, an American television personality. And they're based here in Los Angeles and has a store in Pacific Palace States, California. Liesl began her career in post-apartheid South Africa, where she worked for the South African Human Rights Commission and the Commission for Gender Equality. She led strategic high impact litigations for AIDS law project, including a case that changed the definition of rape. Previously, she worked for Human Rights Watch, where she led the Human Rights Division for over a decade, overseeing work on child marriage, sexual violence, and conflict, abortion, and workers' rights. She was the interim program director for nearly two years, where she led the introduction and implementation of Human Rights Watch's first. 
resilience and Human Rights Watch's COVID response. So we spoke earlier this week and I'm just so excited for Liesl to share with us her perspective, especially with her Human Rights Watch background of how fair trade is fighting for human rights. And now working with the little market, I'm excited for her to share her perspective on how business needs to adapt the values of people over profit. So please take it away. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Alicia. Um, thank you very much for organizing this important discussion. I know that you had really hoped to gather everybody in person, but a small pandemic put a stop to that. So I'm really glad that I'm able to participate because I'm calling in from Brooklyn on the East Coast. I'd also like to really congratulate Councilman Koritz for championing this cause for your leadership. And I think if we've learned anything over the last four years, that ethical leadership is critically important to advancing these values. Um, so Alicia asked me to answer um, two small questions. One was around how one can successfully incorporate fair, the fair trade impact into a business model and whether it is sustainable for a business, can it solve global issues? So I am going to try to answer those questions as best I can, and I, but I also look forward to the discussion. So I'll start with some background on the little market. As Alicia said, it's a nonprofit fair trade shop. We feature ethically sourced artisan, artisan made products. And we try through the sale of these products to empower artisans around the world by extending their products distribu distribution and supporting sustainable income opportunities. Um, we are really committed to upholding the dignity of artisans um, supporting and celebrating their cultural techniques and trend traditions and also bringing attention to social justice and human rights issues that are faced by their communities. We started in 2013 with five groups and we are currently working um, with around 69 groups and just over 50% of these groups have been with the little market for more than five years. We take very seriously the fair trade principle around long-term durable relationships, and we really invest in the partnership with our artisans. Our mandate um, to really support artisans is kind of encapsulated by this idea that we try to provide dignified hours of work to artisans. So we have worked really hard to define what dignified work means to us. And at this point, we're really looking at two um, main components. One is a livable wage. And during the vetting process, we work with potential partners to understand their model and how they pay artisans. We're very upfront with them that we're committed to fair trade principles, and that includes fair and prompt payment both from our side but also from their side. So we ask them in the very early stages of this vetting process to give us detailed information about the direct costs of producing their product. That includes labor costs. It includes the indirect costs that can include things like training, sourcing, marketing. We also ask and we try to help them calculate how their overhead costs, such as accounting, legal compliance, HR, whatever their overheads are, are calculated. And then once we feel that we have a robust set of data, we also ask groups to provide us with a range of information about their payment structure, including whether their artisans are paid per hour or by product, um, whether they receive regular payment, whether the complexity of the design, for example, has any bearing on the amount of remuneration. So we try to collect a lot of data that allows us to really fully understand how artisans are remunerated for their work, regardless of the form or the entity um, that these groups take. And then once we really understand that, um, we try to calculate what a livable wage is. We take into account World Bank data about livable minimal wage. We look at national laws and policies. And then we use those answers to calculate average hourly salaries based on the total average of hours that are worked and the average number of items that are produced. We compare these averages to the data in a fair wage guide that we have compiled. This profiles each country's economic context. Um, and we also outline sort of minimum wage 
thresholds, minimum wage and labor laws, etc. And we also obviously reference the fair wage guide, um, which we find very useful. So a key part of our definition of dignified hours is this concept of a living wage. The second part is really understanding the conditions under which our products are produced. So we try to make sure that we understand whether artisans can make these products safely and in a healthy condition. And obviously the issue of their well-being and health became much more important last year during COVID. So we have um, really refined the collection of our data. We work really hard to make sure that we have sort of robust information and we calculate that since 2013 we have provided um, over a million hours of dignified work um, to to the artisans that we've worked with so for me as um, alicia has said in her very kind introduction i come from a human rights background um, and so when i came to the little market it was really clear to me that there's a very significant overlap between the work that I had done in my human rights um, life, which had really been to advance equality, dignity and autonomy of people and fair trade values and principles. So for me, it hasn't really been sort of a significant change in direction. It has felt something, uh, it has felt for me really important, particularly um, at this point, where there is so much more focus on the poor quality of work that is provided to people. I think many of us during this last year have read stories about the, the working poor, about people who have jobs, sometimes more than one job, but who are not able to make their rent, who certainly cannot afford to pay for health insurance, and so I really think a key human rights principle has been this concept of decent work and dignified work. And I think really what the fair trade movement is all about is about giving people those opportunities to have dignified work and then putting them in a position where they're able to really make decisions about their lives, to have autonomy and to have choices. So I have felt in many ways um, that really the sort of human rights project of transforming this to a fairer, just and more equitable world is really the same project that the fair trade movement um, is engaged in. Um, the last thing I want to talk, and I think both Paul and Peg have touched upon this, is whether, you know, fair trade is the future of business. And I really strongly believe that it is beginning to answer some very important questions, particularly that young consumers are asking. We're in the midst of a global reckoning around poverty and inequality, racial justice, gender justice and climate change. There's a growing awareness amongst consumers about where their products come from, the impact of how those products are sourced on people and the planet, and I think people are beginning to ask difficult questions about how their consumerism, how fast fashion, how um, uh, opaque and su su opaque supply chains that lack transparency have contributed not only to human rights violations, but to huge damage to the planet. And I think that more than ever, social justice groups, human rights groups, fair trade groups are thinking about the implications of business and trade. For example, Human Rights Watch, while I was there, began about five years ago to do a very, very large body of work that is looking at human rights violations and supply chains. So an issue that I think has been very much a niche issue, often for the fair trade movement, is becoming a much more mainstream global human rights development, humanitarian, social justice issue. And I think that so many young people and, and you know, I am not somebody who is very good on Instagram or TikTok, but I, you know, I have tech support in the form of two children who are much more um, adept at this. But if I look at some of the things that they are looking on these platforms, they're asking tough questions about where they buy their clothes. I mean, I have a 20-year-old daughter who will not buy new clothes 
as a matter of principle. And that doesn't come from me. That comes from her generation where they have access to information. They understand the consequences of their decision making as consumers and purchases. And I think that we are only going to see more of that. So Alicia, I'm going to close by trying to answer your question. Is fair trade um, is fair trade the answer? And I think for some really, really important um, questions, yes, it is. So the little market, I think, is is really pleased to be part of the fair trade movement. It is absolutely core to how we think about our internal values, how we think about the way that we work with our partner artisans, and also how we think about how we position ourselves in um, the economy. So I feel very certain that this is only the first of many discussions that we'll be having, that there's a much wider audience for it. And that I am absolutely convinced that we will see a 2028 Fair Trade Olympics in LA. I think New York, which is where I'm at, is going to have to run quite hard to catch up with that. So thank you very much again, Alicia, for, for inviting me and for actually convening this important discussion tonight. Thank you so much, Liesl. Um, you have brought so much clarity just in terms of fair trade as a movement. I started, um, I guess, in this journey when I started going to Haiti and just seeing the extreme poverty there. And that's where I found my passion in, in helping end poverty through job creation. And, but it is, and I, but I realized that not only do I see that, like other people see that and they take advantage of that. They see that people in extreme poverty, you know, is desperate and they take advantage. And so I realized that it's not just about ending poverty through job creation, you have to do it in a fair and just way. And I really believe that that's where fair trade comes in. And so- And I think that's such a critical question that you've asked because, you know, I started out my career as a human rights lawyer and it didn't take me long to realize that when the people that I was working with and I started working on domestic violence, then I worked on HIV, nobody ever really put a lawyer at the top of their list of things that they really wanted. What they wanted was the ability to earn a decent living and the capacity to make their own choices about the important things in their life, where they lived, what food they put on their, their table, their ability to educate their children. And I think fair trade answers some of those questions in a way that other movements haven't fully grappled with. You know, it is the answer to the question that it is great to be able to provide people with a lawyer when they need it, but it is so much better when people are able to decide having choices about sort of these things in their life. So that's why I think the movement is really important. And I think that point you make about sort of people needing to be able to earn their own living and doing that in a fair way is such a critical thing that fair trade is doing that I think often when people think about fair trade, they think about chocolate and coffee. Mm -hmm. But I think this is the message that we have to get out more is that it's giving people independence, autonomy and dignity that I think is absolutely at the heart of what we're trying to do with this movement. Mm, absolutely. Oof. I feel that conviction. <laughs> I love it. You know, since Felicia is frozen, I wonder, I know that council member, you may have something else coming up that you have to go to next. Maybe like if there are questions you first. You can fight for social oh, justice simply by how you shop. You... Oh. Um, yeah, I always like to tell people you can fight for social justice simply by how you shop. You don't just have to donate a ton of money or move across to another country, but just with your grocery shopping, the coffee you drink, the chocolate you buy, you can fight for social justice. The power is in your hands and that's the power of fair trade. So I'm going to try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, and I'll start with this uh, from Joan Harper. What practical things can be done with your influence? And I'm assuming it's the influence of the each individual speaker to engage your cons constituents, consumers in embracing fair trade. So what practical things can be done with your influence to 
engage the consumers to embrace fair trade. So I would just defer to the council member first since you may have something else that he has to go to, so. Thank you. Um, well, I, I would say the most obvious thing that we've done is, uh, is put articles in our newsletter about it. Mm -hmm. um, we probably honestly would have done more since this had passed, but we have a few little crises that uh, you might have uh, noticed in <sighs> as uh, dealing with our our financial difficulties as a result. But uh, I, I think that's definitely an area of focus. Um, I I have not made sure that my uh, my co-presenters of this motion have done the same, which they should in their their newsletters. Um, also, one of my co-presenters is uh, Joe Buscaina, who represents the ports. And uh, I also have a pretty decent relationship with ILWU. And uh, not only should they be involved in this, and I don't know if they're aware if there's been any outreach uh, to them, but uh, frankly, the whole labor movement should be more involved. And so um, having, having gotten that thought through the course of this discussion and, and that question, um, I should probably do more to work with the labor movement to get them involved. So uh, hopefully uh, uh, you all can help me uh, uh, with the specifics of what we want them to do. And they can get the word out to many, many tens of thousands of folks in the labor movement since a good chunk of this is ensuring that there are decent wages and working conditions and that, that this works for uh, labor. Um, both workers that are in unions and not. So uh, I think that could be one of the most promising things that I can help do. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm um, at the little market. We're doing two, there are two um, really, I think important advocacy goals or advocacy campaigns that we're really behind and they connect to what the councilman said. One is that we are very supportive of a national policy around paid leave. We think that is an absolutely critical component of decent work. The other thing that we are particularly keen to see is um, the Pregnancy Fairness Act get passed because we think a lot of the artisans that we work with are women and you know women experience often very negative consequences as a result of becoming pregnant and their childcare responsibilities so i think certainly in this country it's very important to continue the conversation about what decent work looks like in terms of wages and in terms of working conditions. So those two things, which I think actually we may not be, I think we have a shouting chance of getting those through in this administration. I think there are really critical components um, of fair trade, um, you know, around decent work. Um, and so th those are two things that we have been very supportive of and that we are participating in. Um. And, and I would just add that as consumers, you really do have a lot of power. And I, I know we had a question around how can students help make change? So um, I, think, I think what's wonderful about this resolution and becoming a fair trade city and the idea of procurement is actually spending those dollars um, wherever it's feasible on, on fair trade products. And so students could ask their university, could you please serve fair trade coffee, fair trade tea, fair trade sugar in the cafeteria? Um, you know, if you're getting t-shirts for events, can there be fair trade cotton? Can you keep recruiting, um, you know, younger students? Because when students graduate, they go out in the world and do great things, but you need to keep other students engaged. Um, but I love the idea about the procurement. But also, you know, if you don't, if one of the products that you like isn't fair trade, contact the company and say, why aren't you sourcing from fair trade? And I will just say that, um, there was a, one of our one of our licensees started out as a relatively small company, you know, started by someone who's kind of a natural foods devotee and was bought by a bigger company who um, initially was looking at fair trade and saying, mm, you know, how does this connect to 
profitability and so forth, um, their own consumers said, no, 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 you need to stick with us. We really, we like this and we value it. So, you know, you really do have that, you do have that power. So that's, that's a way to exercise it. Um, and I'll also just connect to another question that people had around, um, you know, citizen diplomacy. Um, you know, this is again, a way that you are helping people, partnering with people around the world and, 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 you know, building what was said earlier, people want trade and not aid. The number one thing that we hear from the, the farmers and workers and artisans we work with, um, can you just please help us sell more in the US? And that's the same with Fair Trade Canada and others. That's what they, they, they just really want um, to be able to have that chance here to connect with consumers like you all, which helps them make a decent living. So that's really one of the biggest things you can do. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We tackled several questions. Um, I will jump to the next one for Liesl. Do all of uh, the little market artisan partners, oh, are they all certified? And if not, how do you guarantee transparency and traceability to the consumers? And that is actually a really important question for um, fair trade or ethical businesses who may not all be able to afford the certification quite yet. So, yeah. So, not every not everybody we work with um, is certified because we work with a whole range of enterprises we work with some who have several hundred artisans and many of them are certified we also work with tiny groups that have five or six artisans so the purpose of our vetting process is to gather as much information as we can about who the group is who's working for them how they're paying them how the products are being made what kind of um, materials are being used in making the products, et cetera, et cetera. So where groups are not certified, we try as much as possible to do the due diligence um, that allows us to really see whether they're, were, even if they're not certified, that they're complying with the core principles of fair trade. One of the things that we have done for some partners is that we have helped them to get certified. So we have tried to really share our information, support them, be a resource for them. And we've had several that have become certified as a result of that. But where they're not certified, it's not an automatic disqualify for us, but we do try to be as careful as we can that we are not working with anybody that is where there's exploitation, um, where there is unfair labor practices and so on. Thank you. Um, another question here, and maybe Peg, you can answer this one. How can we help raise awareness to help consumers better understand what the high standards of fair trade label is, as opposed to some of the labels certified by brands as an attempt to greenwash or profit from the proximity confusion of similar looking labels? That is a great question. I just pasted it in the chat. Um, there is a sort of independent advocacy organization called the Fair World Project. And they look at certifiers, including us, you know, and they 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 sort of have check marks and evaluate um, are you what standards are you actually adhering to? Um, and you know, they 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 just they, they call it like they see it. So I think that's a really great resource for folks. But it is a really good question because um, it is like checking your own homework if you're a company and you have your own program. So in a way, it's a great thing that, you know, the companies are saying, no, we're really committing. We have our own program. They're not all bad. It's not, it's not necessarily they're all bad, but it's not the same as having an outside um, independent body. Um, so, so we would just say that's, that's the value of, of having, you know, other third party certifications for sure. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, and Council Member Koretz, um, I will see if you have anything to share in terms of just fair trade being used like citizen diplomacy or citizen economy to show how the U.S. should spend money. And obviously fair trade cannot undo <laughs> the damage of uh, U.S. military aid and all the money spent there. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's, it's essentially the same thought that I have locally. And I, I, I am not surprised to hear that younger folks are more receptive to this. And I think as, as time goes on, there'll be more and more people that are 
are intensely supportive of this. They're very aware, especially of the uh, uh, damage to our environment. They, they care about uh, human trafficking. They really care about all the issues that fair trade involves. And uh, uh, it's, it's certainly the easiest way for all of us truly to do a lot without having to do too much. I mean, even government, we all purchase. Uh, LA purchases almost $5 billion a year worth of goods um, as a city. And uh, it's an easy opportunity. It's not quite as easy as it seems. Um, however, uh, I would say we've, we've had difficulty um, in the early stages and have not moved that far, partly uh, in terms of identifying um, the goods that are appropriate and uh, are indeed uh, fair trade. Um, appropriate and uh, and also there is there is a competing regulation which we are trying to figure out how to deal with it which is uh, whatever the lowest cost is the city is supposed to buy um, yeah. and so that uh, obviously is often in direct conflict because the cheapest coffee may be uh, produced with slave labor. So do we really want to be buying the cheapest uh, coffee for mm -hmm. uh, government entities, or do we want to be sure that we're buying the least expensive coffee that is, is produced appropriately? Obviously, mm -hmm. I think we would all agree that that would be the goal. And so mm -hmm. even though the city has, has given that directive, we have to figure out how we deal with these, these uh, conflicting goals and implement them. Yeah. So we're, we're in that process. Um, but uh, I mean, doing this at all levels of government, as well as the consumer making some very easy choices between, uh, as the most easy example, of course, is coffee again, buying one brand of coffee that is, is uh, harvested and produced sustainably and another that isn't. Um, it's an easy choice that makes a big difference. It's just that most people aren't aware of it. So wow. give, putting the labels on, the more labeling we do, the more people will get it. And frankly, mm -hmm. fair trade sounds good even if uh, you aren't informed on exactly what it means. Mm -hmm. So getting that labels on, label onto products, uh, especially if we could ever get that label onto beef products to be sure that uh, all the people that are unknowingly buying Brazilian beef um, aren't doing that. Uh, all of that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you shared about the government or just, you know, the city purchasing the cheapest product, I think that's a struggle that we all have as individuals, because I don't know about you guys, but that's what I was taught growing up. You find the best deals. It's not about the person who makes it. It's about your benefit. You know, you get the best deal. And so the whole fair trade movement is really fighting against that mindset and changing that mindset of okay it's not now let's think about the other side of the makers the producers the people who actually created these products for you to buy so it's absolutely something that the fair trade movement is that's why we exist to educate and to help people think in that direction so um and if i, I could that, add, add just a little bit of, yeah. of personal irony um, mm -hmm. I'm in the process of running for city controller in Los Angeles. So the quirky thing for me will be to explain why I'm trying to get the city to purchase more expensive products uh, rather than less expensive products. Uh, because our, our, our uh, responsibility in that office is efficiency. But uh, mm -hmm. there's obviously uh, a lot more to it than that. And uh, uh, that's something we have to explain and market to a lot of people. But once everyone mm -hmm. understands that, I, I think this will be a more and more successful uh, movement that will have tremendous momentum, not only in our yeah. city, but worldwide. Absolutely. I think LA has the power to lead in terms of valuing people over profit. So Peg, I would, just, I would just add quickly to council member and hopefully controller soon. Um, there's so many people in Los Angeles who's, who's, who grew up on these farms or their, their parents did, and they know what it's like and they know the conditions. And so maybe that's one way to appeal to folks as well is just to say, you know, I mean, 
you don't you you all know you don't you don't have to be an activist based on your personal lived experience, but it may be that some of the constituents and folks would, would, would really get that this is a valuable thing to do as well. Yeah. Well, I know that we are coming to the end of our time and um, thank you, Peg, for sharing the Fair Trade Finder link um, in the chat. Please take advantage of that. And I know that I shared information on how you can get more involved in Fair Trade LA, but I do want to end with this because I know that we have a lot of students here from Port of Los Angeles High School and just talking, our topic is the future of Fair Trade. So, how, you know, it's all about, okay, how do we generation share I guess closing thoughts on how students or maybe in more in general the future generation or just how people consumers individuals whether they have money or not um, how can they get involved and help advance the fair trade movement anyone can start <laughs> Well, I love what you said about trade over aid. So by buying fair trade, we don't have to then figure out how to get to them to help them later, help them now mm -hmm. in advance. Yeah. Peg, Liesl, or council member? I have, a quick, I have a quick thought just because I, I was asked at a, by some college students recently, like this fair trade is great, but gee, some of these products are kind of high end and you know, just to, it's exactly the point about cost. Um, I think you all have Aldi stores, um, mm -hmm. discount supermarket in LA and, and they actually sell quite a few um, house, I'm not trying to push one company over the other, by the way, but it was, I'm just saying, I just got the question from college students, like how can we affordably do this? Um, Everybody, of course, should, should wants to have a good deal. But um, if there's an Aldi near you, they do have a lot of uh, fair trade products, their, their house label. I would just reiterate, I think, what Peg said earlier, and that is around um, students really pressurizing. You know, many students go to big, important, powerful, wealthy institutions. So really using their voices to ensure that there's fair trade coffee and sugar and tea in the cafeteria, um, because I think, you know, that's how it's going to change is where, you know, one by one, we see important influential in institutions being able to really understand the importance of doing this. And I think students have important voices and we know that in the past they've been able to make change. So I think that's a really clear campaign that students could run that could be very effective and very impactful. I have to say, I, I love that thought that uh, uh, certainly students could have the most impact uh, if they go to uh, some of the huge colleges that, uh, that we have throughout, certainly throughout Los Angeles. I mean, if you uh, go to uh, my alma mater, UCLA, um, were you to make changes in the uh, foods that they serve on campus, you would have a massive instant impact. Um, and I don't know if there's uh, a move afoot to do that at uh, USC, UCLA, uh, Loyola. We have a number of, of large and very notable universities. And uh, mm -hmm. students making just those changes and advocating beyond yeah. LA to uh, uh, colleges across the country would make a massive difference uh, just through those institutions alone. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe if, if students have uh, the goal of, of accomplishing something significant in this arena, uh, that might be the, the easiest and best place to focus on, on their own campuses and future campuses. I'm really glad on this because um, students, but honestly, every consumer has the power and we have high schools having fair trade clubs. Um, even I graduated from UCLA as well. UCLA has a fair trade club and LMU, it was the students that led the fair trade movement that 
um, where coffee bean responded and created a fair trade blend just for that university. And LMU is a fair trade university, UCLA is a fair trade university. I know we're working on USC. And so even congregations, um, even your office, like it's not just limited to students, it's wherever you're at, you have the power to educate and, and make your organization fair trade by serving fair trade. And, um, but uh, again, it goes back to educating. It, it's bringing awareness. So please, I would say, join your local campaign. If you're not based in Los Angeles, find your local campaign. But if you are based in Los Angeles, come visit fairtradela.org. Email me at fairtradela at gmail.com, follow us. Um, so with that, I would just like to say thank you to all of our speakers for your time. Thank you all for tuning in today. And I encourage you once again to just get involved with any local fair trade um, organization as you can, because they do need your support. Like as a, as a nonprofit here in LA, I understand we need your support. And so try to get involved. And I see several of you already became a member and we're excited to have you. So feel free to become a member of Fairtrade LA and stay in touch with us. We always have events like this with very engaging conversations and um, yeah. Thank you all so Thank much you. for having us, being with us, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, lastly, for World Fair Trade Day, we want to give you guys all 20% off, off our shop so you can add more fair trade to your life. So if you go to fairtrade.org, use discount code buy fair live fair at checkout and um, you guys can enjoy some shopping there. So with that, have a good evening, everybody, and happy World Fair Trade Day. Thank you. Good Thank night. You Thank you, everybody. Good night. Hi, Alicia. Hi. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, great to see you. I just left you a note. Great job. It was really informative. Thank you. That hope, was. Uh, hope to see you as part of our little thing coming up next month. Yes, for your true cost, right? Yes. Yeah. Barbara was trying to get a hold of, of you guys to see if you could meet up with Tony. Um, to go do a run through on the webinar. Oh, okay. Okay. It looks like you might have to do it at night because the other gal, it probably, you know, probably easier for you too. You know, some people do still work. Yeah, I am excited for that. And I think it'll go really well. And we will love to promote that as well. The fair trade LA. Yeah, I feel good. The sound tonight is really good. I like them. We have to yeah, watch for him coming I am up on really the ballot. Impressed. Yeah, I'm really impressed by all the speakers. They all brought something to the table. Yeah. All right, sweetie. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye bye. See you.